Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, supported by Lacole. Here with my co-host Benji Nyson for the Giro d'Italia Stage 15 recap. We will also have at the end of this podcast a Welter of Burgos Stages 3 and 4 recaps. If you're listening on podcast players on YouTube, that will be a separate video. Today's stage is the stage that goes into Slovenia. I thought one force again, the man we picked yesterday from Grado to Gorizia, 146Ks, they do a circuit with a quite a nasty climb, 1.7Ks, 8.1%. And then there's a last climb, the last of those circuit climbs finishes about mm, 17Ks to go. Then they've got a little 600 meter roller at 8.1%. The circuit climb actually has some like 14% pinches in it, a really steep 400, 600 meter section. But we called Sagan Benji, we're in the Malia Ciclomino right now. But before the stage, he said they weren't interested really. They're just going to go for the Ciclomino points. It's all abandoned this morning. So, a bit of a blow for the race, both of those news coming out. And then there was further blows when the stage initially kicked off. Yes, we had, uh, well, the first attempts for the break in the first 500 meters after the race starting off officially. And we had a crash in the peloton, like directly. The race was on, boom, people are down. It was a pretty, uh, a pretty severe crash, but you got to keep in mind they started at a spot where in the first kilometer they go onto this long bridge or long like road with water around it. So the only way to get to that point is from the start of that uh, road and from the end of that road. So probably not the easiest place to get access to. And because of the crash, they decided to... Uh, to neutralize the race and that means that the people that had roughly 10 meters trying to get away from the peloton were angry at the commissaire for neutralizing the race but i was considering well perhaps there's a good reason to this likely there's a good reason to this because we're only 500 meters in it's not the worst thing in the world if we neutralize the race here personally and eventually the reasons behind it are honestly quite simple and i've got this from paul watson a, a uci commissaire that posted this on Twitter. As a UCI commissaire, we must stop the race now for no medical cover left. So basically, um, let's say that they need X amount of ambulances and they've got that same amount of ambulances in the race. If they let the race go on and five kilometers later, a group crashes and they need another ambulance, they've, they're in trouble. The race is unsafe at that point. So they're doing this to ensure that any incidents following this will have the necessary medical attention. And considering it didn't really have almost any effect to the race, I was completely fine with it. Do you have a special take on uh, the situation? or No, continue? not really. It seems like the smartest option. Yes, there's always going to be someone who's disadvantaged by this being the riders who got, actually got into the initial break. No guarantee they would have gone. But yeah. I think they had to make that decision. It was just, uh, if you look at the photos we've provided or you go and watch the start of the race, you'll see what Benji means about it being a narrow one-way bridge they're on. There's a waterway next to it, so they couldn't bring ambulances from the other side. Uh, the abandons that came out of that were Nutnail Barane, hurt his left shoulder, looked like a collarbone for Cofferdis, real shame for him, as well as Emmanuel Buchmann. Currently he was sixth on GC, the poor guy. It's a real shame. He seems to always have bad luck abandoning. Um, he hurt his face pretty badly, cut up his mouth, it seemed. Concussion, also, I think, but I'm not a doctor, And, and a concussion. But he obviously hit his, he hit his head yeah, and yeah. that was it. So they pulled him out, which is a shame, as well as Jos van Emden for Jumbo Bisma, who maybe would have had a good result in the last TT and has actually been pretty strong all throughout this year. So not a great start. And, yeah, we just saw the riders all lined up at the front waiting for the race to kick off again. And as it did, uh, so maybe 20 minutes later or more, we saw Sagan sprinting straight away, and it was a battle between him and Gaviria. He's trying to mark Gaviria going for the Ciclamino points because there was the intermediate sprint points with 53Ks done. Those two just neutralized each other. He sat up, and then just a huge breakaway go went, and a strong one too. Have you got the list of who was in that break, Benji? Yes, we had two riders from Alpes and Phoenix, Dries de Bond and Oscar Rizebeek. We've got Simone Consoni, the lead out of Viviani, in this breakaway for Kofferis. Uh, Lars van den Berg, van der Berg, my bad, for I think, Grupama. Quinten Hermans was there for one deal. Dani and Van Hooke were there for the team of Lotto. We had Cataldo and Torres for Movistar. Nick is on for 
uh, whatever Sun Whip is called again, DSM, <laughs> and Campenarts for Quebec together with Walshight, and I think also Wisniewski rides for that team now. Molema for Trek and Milano for UAE. So a pretty large breakaway, definitely. And a breakaway with riders that, well, Molema said yesterday that he'd been focusing on the smaller climbs, the punchy climbs, because on the big climbs, well, those don't come into play in the Ardennes, which he was training for. And that was the reason that he wasn't so great on the climb so far in this Giro. So I thought, Molema's in the break. We've got hills in this race. Perhaps this should fit him better, according to what he said yesterday. So that's one of the things. Things like Campenard, we've seen an attack so, so many times in breakaway so far. He was going to try something, and if he attacks, he's going to be just before a hill somewhere to make sure he's got a bit of a gap on the others with someone else, perhaps, to make sure he can benefit off of that as he's not the best climber in the group on paper. Nick Yazan, I think he's won a stage in the Tour de France a Giro. few days ago. He won, he won a rainy stage for okay. a big break in the Giro, oh, I yeah. think. Cedar Sprinter Specialist. Um He's the man I had when I saw this break go. I thought it fit him perfectly. He won a yep. stage, and he's won a stage in the World Tour in 2019. The man, he's usually a good lead out because he's seeded sprints, but in a group like this, he can win. And uh, yeah, it's the break went a bit. Dis- I got a, I, you can probably hear it. I was disappointed, frankly. This, this stage didn't live up to what it could be. I'm sure RCS are pretty disappointed. Benji and I might talk about it afterwards, but. Sunday stage, yesterday Zonkalan, I wouldn't have called it epic by any stretch. And then you got Sagan and Bora saying, don't care about it either. And uh, Israel didn't chase for Chimalai, which I thought was disappointing too. Uh, they could have, uh, if I was Chimalai, I would have wanted them to chase as well, given that we've got Nit Solo dropping out too. So the sprint field's weakened even further. Ineos took up the mantle of chasing with like a gap of 10 minutes. They let that go up to 14, 15, and uh, everyone pretty much switched off. I think the action, so we knew the break was winning 100% from like straight away, especially when you've got the the riders who might be winning this stage, Gavidia, saying, uh, Gavidia in particular and Viviani, they've sent lead out men into the break, which means they ain't going to chase in Consoni and Molano, as well as I mean, Quebec are hats off to them. Volscheid, Wisniewski, and Kampenarts getting three and then in there. It's not easy to do that, uh, especially right off, off the gun. But when did the first attacks start coming out of the break, Benji? Was it VC, really, with about 22 k to go? It was a little bit earlier. Yeah, I think that was the, the main one, I'd say, that could offer an opportunity of doing something. Because beforehand, the break was working relatively well with the fact that some teams had teammates so that always helps with the group yeah. actually doing something and like to be honest they had 13 minutes they didn't really have to work too much to to, to stay away from that point onwards but well we had that attack from company arts and i think the initial reaction to that Cataldo. was from uh Cataldo. yes but that didn't really seem to go anywhere because it seems like they got caught and company arts had to try again and then it was torres for Movistar, who made the move and was in the wheel. And we also saw Rizabek be in that group as well. And those three actually got a pretty serious gap because Kitaldo was at the front of the second group and he wasn't going to take over. And then you've got two other Quebec riders in that group also not going to take over. And who's going to take over? Everybody's going to look at one team with two riders there. That's Van Hook and Aldani. And that's exactly what they did. They looked at Lotto Sudel and they waited and they said, okay, you've got two riders, offer someone. Okay. And the sacrifice was made. And eventually it seems like we saw Aldani riding for Van Hooke, which I found a bit weird because we've seen Aldani climb well in Provence and he's got a sprint. And he's quick. And yesterday I said he was a chance or an opportunist for the actual sprint today if it comes down to a real sprint. Yeah, so sure. Top five. Perhaps it's there's a reasoning behind it. Perhaps he wasn't feeling so good. So there's all those reasons. But logically, I would have said, okay, I think that Oldani can climb with the likes of a Campenarts on this climb, for example, and a Van Hooke as well. But in the end, the result is more suited for Oldani and the sprint itself if it comes down to a small sprint. So a bit of a weird choice, but it probably has some reason behind it that we aren't completely aware about, I guess. And yeah, they started chasing. 15, oh. 15 Ks to go. Torres gets dropped. So a bit weird from Movistar too. It's like, which one of them is stronger? Neither Torres nor Cataldo <laughs> were particularly <laughs> strong when it came down to it. Dropped by Rizovic and Campanats, yeah. I think on the last ascent of the think, Gornje Ch- uh, Chorovo. Yes. I think that oh, was it on the descent? I was, yeah, that's true. Just before the uh, 
top of that climb, he got dropped just on the top. Like, literally, he was 10 meters behind on the top. Yeah. And Kampenards dove into the descent, put pressure on Rizabeg. But just getting a bit backwards there, I want to talk about the fact that I was like, I saw Cataldo responding to the three-man group, including Torres, for a moment there. And I was like, yeah, oh, that's Movistar, right. what are you doing? But then again, <laughs> I could have also like thought, well, perhaps they know that Torres is never going to follow these two. Yeah. And then the question is, why did Torres react? Perhaps because he was in the best position and was the first to react to that attack by Camponards. Ah, I don't know if I can blame them for this necessarily, but it just wasn't the he optimal He might have just outcome. been trying to bridge. Yeah, he might perhaps. have just been trying to bridge with her, with Quinton Hardemans as well at the same time. Um, but it starts raining really, really heavily. So it's been dry, starts bucketing down. We see it on the breakaway first. Peloton's 15 minutes behind. And we've got the race situation with 11 k's to go of Campanats and Riesebeek. So Campanats, the TT guy, and looking a little bit better than Riesebeek on the technical sections, I think. But Riesebeek with the better sprint, do you think, on paper. Behind them, they've got still Consoni, Van Hocker, Cataldo, Molima. I think Dries de Bont had been dropped at that point, as well as the other two Quebecer riders, Quinton Hermans, Nicky Sant, and Torres were sort of oh, three, four seconds ahead of uh, the Consoni group. Yeah. And eventually, eventually, I think Riesebeck and Campanats just started attacking each other. First with, well, Campanats accelerated on the descent and on a, a couple of times trying to gap Riesebeck and he just dangled like 10, sec- 10 metres in front of him or 15 minutes in front of him and then eventually Riesebeck would close it with 10 k's to go. They've only got like 25 seconds, 20 seconds on a group that had two Movistar riders in it, Cataldo and Torres. And you think, well, if they mess around now, I mean, 8 k's, they're going to get closed down. They didn't. Riesebeck still then, atta- then attacked Campanats. What did you make of Riesebeck attacking Campanats, Benji, when, I mean, Campanats bars, can- I don't even know if he can sprint properly. I don't know. I, f- I don't know whether one is better at a sprint than the other, but I know that Riesebeck, he's got a pretty decent history in in the hill race. I think he got top 10 in Bravo on Sapel, and he was lost in the sprint of that group, though. So perhaps he just completely doesn't trust the sprint. Then if he knows from his history that, Every single sprint he rode, he failed in doing so. Then I get that he attacked. I, I don't know enough about the both of them in a sprinty situation because they barely get into those situations. So it's very hard to say, oh, this person is going to win. But that does play into the mental uh, game here because Rizabek showed that he doesn't trust a sprint by that attack. And that might give Campanards the opinion that, okay, perhaps I just need to follow now. But then again, he also started attacking Rizabek. So I think they both just weren't confident of their sprint. And that's understandable for riders that don't sprint. Like, I don't think I've seen either of them in a reduced bunch sprint or reduced group sprint at any point in their career so far. And a rider like Campanard, who made the move from time trials, hasn't gotten in that opportunity yet. A rider like Rizabek, who's been performing well, but never really is in the group that makes it and never is good enough to being the decisive art dens or anything stuff like that ah it's just a bit of an unknown so they they started making that move and while these two were attacking each other and to be honest whenever they attacked there was a 10 meter gap be- between them for like a good two minutes until yeah. they caught each other again <laughs> it, it was, was really the- funny it was like when two um Ex prize fighters who are now like a little bit past it and are 40 years old. They're in a 12 round boxing match and they're both so tired that they can't defend, but they're also too tired to knock each other out. And they're just like swinging wildly yeah. at each other, it's like hitting each other in the, the of- face. That was, that was always yeah. happening attack, attack. And then they're like, I'm too tired to close, but you're too tired to keep the gap open. <laughs> just stop pedaling. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very, very bad comparison, but. I feel like it reminded me of the moments when when Heyman and Tom Bonin were sprinting after each other in that Roubaix that Heyman eventually won. The the attacks that Heyman and Bonin were doing in those last kilometers, those are the kind of attacks that Campenards and Rizabek were doing here. Just Never trying disrespect. to get away, but nah. Never disrespect Matt Heyman like that <laughs> on this podcast. I had Gross to do it, man. Ever. I had to do it. But one All of the right. things that, one of the details that I want to put in here is that in the group behind, their chase was ah, not going too well. One of the lot of riders was gone. Uh, they came closer a bit once the first two riders, after they attacked each other, 
decided like, okay, Rizabek is not taking over from Campanarts anymore. Very early on. 16, like, 16 seconds with like exactly. three Ks to go. And yeah. there was this corner that the second group goes into and Molema just straight up matrixes himself out of crashing. <laughs> he, he jackknifed himself. Uh, crazy how he <laughs> saved himself. Like re- looking at that in slow motion, there, when I saw that, I was like, he's crashing, he's crashing. How did he not crash? How he did nearly, he not crash? He nearly crashed the whole chase group and then the chase <laughs> pretty much stopped afterwards. Yeah. He's like oversteered to, to the left and then it's like bucked his bike and he's flicked his whole bike. Then hor- he's now horizontal with the road with the, all the guys behind him <laughs> and he's swung back like when a, on a highway when a truck jackknifes. And he's, yeah, as Pidgey said, I don't know how he held it up, but that goes to show probably how tired they were, wet roads, freshly wet roads, and that was pretty much the oomph out of the chase and now we've just got Campanut <laughs> still in Riesebeck with the, yeah, the oomph out of the chase with two Ks to go Chase is uh, uh, Riesebeck and Campanut have got 10, 14 seconds it's still hovered, been stable these guys have they've attacked each other Campanut's been speaking to him saying oh should we just ride it in I guess because we've got the chase behind and the chase wasn't gaining on them so we know they're going clear I think the Riesebeck, Riesebeck attacks Campanut's again then Campanut's does one Big last attack, I think, with 2.8 Ks to go, or maybe even less. He big attack from Campanarts, and he holds the gap for a little bit. Eventually, Riesebeck gets back to him, and so we under the Flamme Rouge. Campanarts freshly attacked. He's leading it out. We've got a glass corner about 300 meters to go. We're thinking Riesebeck's got to have this. He's a better sprinter, I thought, on paper. Campanarts has got to be more tired now, surely. Riesebeck getting the lead out to opens up his sprint with Campanarts looking at him with like 300 metres to go. Campan- he gaps him. Campanarts claws his way back to Riesebeck's wheel, gets the draft, and eventually Riesebeck runs out of steam with like 50, 60 metres from the line, and Campanarts is able to just continue sprinting and wins by over a bike length, his first Grand Tour stage win this stage 15 of the Giro d'Italia, an absolute slugfest in the break. And I think... He saw in the interview afterwards, Risa Beck was rightly disappointed. He completely stuffed up the finale, and um, I think he knew that, which is a shame for him. But, yeah, anything – I mean, how do you think he should have played that final 500 metres, Benji? Well, I don't think he should have launched the 300 metres to go. Like, that's the one mistake that's, like, obvious, I think. And it also surprised me that he launched early because from the attack that Risa Beck did beforehand, he always gapped Campanarts. And perhaps Campanarts was like keeping himself on a bit of a gap on purpose, but I doubt he would do that. The thing is, when Campanarts attacked, he also gapped Rizabek. So it's it's very difficult to say what would have happened if he waited until 200 meters to go, because then Rizabek would have been able to have that initial kick that I think he's a tiny bit better at than Campanarts. But would Campanarts have enough time to come back and crawl over him? I feel like Rizabek still set up very early, so he was probably done for. But I just think that those two riders had their opportunity of this year. And I think that Rizabek said in the interview afterwards, very disappointingly, like you mentioned, um, the exact words in the following, uh, yeah, this, uh, it feels like this might have been a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But I'm not so sure about that. If you can top 10 Bravo on Sapel, then you can get into yeah. more decisive breaks or breakaways. I don't believe that it's, it's a one-time thing. You can do more than that. And I think that if Velta would fit his type of character pretty well, but I don't think he's going to have too many Grand Tours with so many breakaways there. <laughs> that's for That's sure. the thing, yeah. Before we read out the top 10 results, big shout out to our show partner, LeCole. If you're listening to the podcast, you can get it 20% off on all items, including already discounted items using the code LRCP20 to get 20% sent off that's lrcp20 all caps to the link down below I'll do the top 10 results we started recording this before the peloton had even crossed the line but here we are the top 10 <laughs> results now campanar theresa beck and then winning the bunch sprint behind was nikki Asant. i thought as he was always gonna be the quickest man i thought that he just was unlucky with them uh yeah two riders staying away consoni fourth herman's fifth cataldo sixth Molina seventh, then Torres, Molana, Valshine make up the top ten. In terms of GC, no change except Bookman now moving out, going into tomorrow's stage. 
uh, which is supposed to be a GC stage. So Bernal, 90 seconds ahead of Yates, 150 ahead of Caruso, 157 ahead of Vlasov, 211 ahead of Carthy, Chicone at three, Evan Paul, 352. Martinez knocking on the door, 3.54, and Foss, 5.37. Volta, 7.49, and Martin, 7.50. Still competing for GC, according to himself and ISN. Yes, Benji. Uh, I want to do a very quick discussion on Chiclamino. So at the start oh, of the yeah. stage, we have Sagan who says, yeah, I don't want to go in the break. Well, he didn't say that. I don't want to have the team pace because, yeah. well, I'm going to play defensively for Chiclamino, which is... I think technically a very good choice, considering we have that year, I think 2018, that the Marwen didn't actually try to get the Peloton another stage win towards the end of the year when then he ended up giving the Chiclamino away to Wackerman. So I think that there's definitely a risk that you take once you have your team pace like that. And Perhaps he didn't have the confidence that he was going to be Chimula at the end. So I'm... Or give it Yeah, exactly. But currently the points in that classification are 135 for Sagan, 113 for Chimula, and 110 for Gaviria. Has Sagan won Chiclamino? Uh, probably. I mean, I don't know where the points are. Uh, is he going to go for the points tomorrow? Probably let a break tank up all the points. Mm. It's... I think that's going to be a strategy, right? Just let all the breaks, big breaks, take all yep. the uh, Chiclamino points. I mean, yeah, I don't really see, <laughs> really see anyone usurping. I agree. Him. So yeah, it's pretty much over with the whimper, uh, which is a bit of a shame because the Chiclamino has acted as the Chiclamino race kind of nullified the stage today, and it. Yeah, I get it, bore it on a pace, and then look like idiots if Sagan loses, and then loses Chiclamino to Gaviria or whatever, but. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame. Uh, but tomorrow's stage, the big one, the hardest stage in cycling so far this year and probably all year from Sacile, Sacile to Cortina d'Ampezzo, 212 kilometres long, 5,500 metres climbing, rain and cold predicted. They start the La Crozetta climb, 11.5k, 7.1% with that crest with 26 k's to go, there'll be a big break shortly at that point. The Chiclamino sprint is with 91 k's done, so maybe Sagan could get over that climb with a break. They do, then do the Paso for Daya, which is 14 k's at 7.5%. Now, I'm just trying to remember, Benji. I think that one, from memory, is a fake news climb. I'm just going to go into my little little archive of stage 16, climb one, <laughs> and it is. It is. I was correct. I'm seeing a lot of black. The, from 10Ks to 14Ks, so the last 4Ks are 11, 11, 12, 10.5, 11 gradient, and the start is not so hard. So hopefully we see some action on that. Hopefully. There's a descent, Paso Corredoi, 12K, 6.5%. That's much more regular valley. And then the climb up to Paso Jiao, uh, 10Ks, 9.5%, a little bit more regular than for Daya, and then a descent into Cortina d'Ampezzo of about. 2018 kilometers flat finish i don't know i'm going with simon yates for the stage win benji okay you're going with simon yates for the stage win i want to talk about bahrain for a bit so i think my general uh, preview pick for the stage was bilbao back in the day because indeed we were thinking about a similar kind of format of a stage in the tour of the alps with a descent towards the line where bilbao had that crazy descent yes but Caruso is on the podium right now, and I think that's that's trouble for him. That might cause that opportunity to get away. I'd love Bilbao to win the stage. I just I'm not sure he's going to get the freedom in that because if Caruso can podium this race, I don't know if you would send Bilbao in the breakaway. Then again, would you send him in the breakaway as a satellite rider? I'd love to see that scenario happen. I think that... And he also, and he also just chase it. I think that I want to go pretty yellow on this stage. I think that it's really hard to say that Caruso is going to win the stage, though. He doesn't have the finish <laughs> quality, but I'd love to see him win a race. <laughs> How? Ah, How you, he's never it? doing it. <laughs> he's better at the, the stages with like, multiple sprint. climbs. That That's for certain. Like He's better at that than he was at a climb like Zonkolon, for example, with a single finish at the end. But the stage has that climb at the start. 
and that means that I see a large breakaway getting away. I do not believe the GC riders are going to get the stage, despite really the majestical climbs in it. I believe a breakaway is going to win it. And who are we looking at if the breakaway does win? And that's a really difficult question, isn't it? I am going to say a name as, uh, well, first of all, I don't think Dan Martin's going to win from a breakaway because he's still too close in GC to do so. And if I have Fabro, to say a name... Fabro, Bookman's gone. Fabro, that's got to be it. How is this descending? I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's so small, so good on the climbs. I, I, and <laughs> He's so be, small, be, you won't see him descend. <laughs> Fabro and Groschardner surely will be going in the break tomorrow with Bookman out. That, that's nailed on. I'm going Fabro or... Yeah, I'm going Fabro. I'm taking okay. cancelling Yates because I actually think Bernal's way stronger than him. I just I like to flat, <laughs> flat finish for Yates in the descent. But yeah, Fabro, <laughs> Fabro so, from the break. Let me get this straight. You presented a rider for me to pick and then you stole the pick yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, because you were kind of iffy about it. You were talking about his descending. I've got full confidence yeah. in Matteo. Okay, okay, okay. Well, the Koenig said they wanted to go for stage wins, but to be honest, I think that Almeida is still too close in GC, but I'm not so sure about that. How close is Almeida? 850. Eight, like, he could get it if he attacks on Paso Jao. I don't think Ineos would care too much. Almeida wins a stage. <laughs> so going to regret this, but Almeida wins a stage. <laughs> okay. Well, ho- hopefully it's a good one. And this is the next topic, Benji and I, the last one we wanted to talk about. And a lot of people have been saying a lot of breakaways winning the, at this Euro. Surely RCS cannot be happy with. Uh, I don't understand it, Benji. They've scheduled this stage for the Monday and they've had, uh, let's be frank, today's stage is one of the most boring stages I've watched this year in cycling. Like, I, I don't really. It loses its novelty seeing a massive break of guys that are not even the second or third strongest on their teams going and fighting it out, at, you know, and the GC riders being 15 minutes behind. It's fine a few days, but it's been a lot. And to have that on the Sunday and then you've got Cortina D'Ampezzo on the Monday, I feel like they've missed something there, RCS, and then teams as well. Ineos, you know, we want to ride differently. We want to ride differently because the Grenadier way, it's like, mate, the Grenadier, like no one's buying that. Um Thing, Moscon ah, nah, 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 and Narvaez. Nah, 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 nah. Why can't uh, Moscon and Narvaez go on the break today? Today? Why would they? They've got the Muggler To win also. the stage because they, they want to ride differently. Ben. They want to ride differently, Benji. I'm not saying they should, but that is they, what they've put out to the public. We want to ride did differently. They did on Montalcino. How? They attacked on the first Sterato section. I've never seen a team, including Froome, do that in the past. And again, I've never seen him ride on... I did that on a fucking Sterato section on the Call of Finesse today. Damn it. <laughs> Mate, they... By ride differently, they mean allowing riders to go for stages whilst also competing for GC like they did in the Giro last year. We've seen none of that. I I don't don't believe that Ineos deserves to be criticized for riding the most clever way they can to win the race. Of course not. But then don't lie. That's true. Don't put out in the press that we Correct. ride in this aggressive way. Like, no, you come on, you attack with with Bernal with three hundred meters to go on Song Clan. They like do that. on the races that they're not the leader in, though. But that's obvious. It's logical. Like, yeah, of course, they're doing the right yeah, thing. Exactly. And of course, tomorrow, like, yeah, don't send Moscow and Navas in the break because you want to, you know, on the off chance they get tired or crash, you then you down a man for Danny Martinez. Uh, the, big, the big stage tomorrow. Yeah, Danny Martinez. Well. Okay, do they use Danny Martinez tomorrow as the satellite rider? Do they attack with him or do they pace with him? The thing is, who against? Because in the past, it would be against Quickstep, for example. I don't think Quickstep is in the game for GC anymore, so those won't react. So will it be Bahrain responding to Danny Martinez coming? Yates. Or Yates is uh, the big threat. Package change? Yeah. Are they going to offer would- up Nick Schultz, a rider that... Could also be in the breakaway as a satellite rider for Yates. I don't know. If I'm Ineos tomorrow, I want to test the other teams on P- Paso Jao or earlier with um, with Danny Martinez. I want to test them because Mikel Nieve, Nick Schultz, what do you got? Can you chase back Danny Martinez? Maybe Simon Yates is going to have to do it himself. I think it's a really good strategy to use Martinez in that way. Vlasov, who's he going to have chase for him as well? Carthy can Ruben Guerrero is out now one of his main guys in the mountains he just uh dnf today so i'd use martinez aggressively i think put a lot of pressure on the other teams no. to chase bahrain 
would have been the team to chase, but Landis not here anymore. So yeah, that's how I would argue So they, they, they're losing left and right as well. And there's so many teams that are losing riders. Sivakov's not here for Ineos, but that's the one team that it's not really hurting because they've still got a very strong team left over without Sivakov, arguably still the best by, by a, a pretty long shot. And a lot of people are saying Vincenzo and Ibali for the stage. While my heart would love that, I have a hard time believing that he's going to survive the climbs. <laughs> I'd love exactly. it, but isn't I don't see it happening. Isn't he better on the longer days where it's lower watts per kilo on each climb, but a mm-hmm. long, hard day? He's really good at recovering between climbs. That's what I thought his talent's always been. Technically, yes, but what is he going to do? Is he just going to leave Ciccone squabbling on the beach? Yes. <laughs> yes, I think he would do that <laughs> to go for the stage win. Uh, so hopefully we see that tomorrow. Um, I love it. From Chicone, I mean, he's climbing well. I, I think we might see descent. If they're all together over Passage Al, God forbid, we'll see descent attacks from either Yates or Chicone or Nibali Bardet. or Bardet. Yeah, that's what we can expect. Hopefully it doesn't come to that and there's more action earlier on in the stage. But I, um, what you want? Yeah, any last thoughts, Benji? I recall there being a technical descent on the Fedaya or was it Fedaya? I think it was Fedaya. And that could be a place where a team like Astana could try and hammer it in the descent and yeah. see if they can get an opportunity there. They were able to isolate just bare null with one teammate last time. They did that on a descent that wasn't necessarily the technical one on paper because I didn't see it coming on that one. But people have been talking about Fedaya's descent, but I haven't checked if it's actually technical. But if that's the case, then... I wouldn't be surprised if Astana, who's for like on the first of the three climbs, which oh, on that moment, I'd love it because they're not pacing an entire stage to prepare for a single climb. They're doing one action in a descent that is not blatantly obvious beforehand. Stuff like that, you know? Yeah, hopefully. Um, I'm being a bit disappointed so far this year, so I'm hoping tomorrow is exciting and opens up early. Maybe Astana could be the team to do that but if you're watching on youtube that's all from us today if you're listening on podcast players we'll continue on now with our world trip over stages three and four recaps ciao